We're good. Cool. Uh, so at Netflix, right? Um, I don't have any free shows today, but I swear if you come to the, if you listen to my talk, you got a free subscription. It's called a free trial. Go sign up. That's good. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, 130 million subscribers. Just a little bit about us. We're we're in 190 countries. Uh, something crazy. 140 million hours of streaming content every day. Most of which is from the Snell household, apparently. So, so it's good. Anyway. Our biggest thing is you can watch Netflix on basically any device with a screen and an internet connection, um, and that's largely kind of our promise. You know, we have some, over the years, we've developed some really nice responsive user interfaces, so this is kind of the latest iteration where everything's responsive, video's playing in real time. Um, this is probably what you guys are familiar with. If you are a subscriber, anyone remember with this one? This is 2009, this is what the site looked like, so it's a little bit different. Um, and Kind of the, the, the thing that, that's kind of got us to go from 2009 and this view to this um, is the, how do we make that change, right? How do we go from that really sort of antiquated um, view of the site to this? We do a lot of A-B testing to get there. So we don't just make changes to the site randomly. We actually A-B test everything. So every little change that you make on the site, every little product design improvement, um, anything that happens to the algorithms, they're all A-B tested. Um, in fact, we do a lot of A-B testing um, at Netflix. Um, when I say a lot, I mean really a lot, like a thousand, thousands of A-B tests a year. Each of them has tens or twenty variations, so it's a lot of changes happening to the service um, at one time. Um, and as most of you know, actually, the service is made up of a bunch of uh, microservices on the back end. So here's a live view of Netflix traffic uh, in one of our data centers. And literally, there's about 200 services that make up the Netflix data graph. So quite a lot of services. Um, each of them is responsible for a small part of Netflix, uh, and not all of it. And so the question I want to pose to the audience is, how do the clients, of which we have you know, quite a few out in front, talk to all the back-end services, right? Do they all talk to each other at once? 200 services, lots of devices. Probably not the best idea. Um, and we thought, we thought so too, and so instead, we have something called the Netflix API um, that both the backend services and the front-end devices talk to. And this gives us that flexibility to be able to integrate both the front-end and the back-end without having to make changes, uh, having each, each of them make changes to each other. And you see what I mean in a second. So the API decouples clients from the backend services, and it provides an integration point for both services and clients. Um, and what's really important, actually, is that we use something called the BFF pattern, so the back-end for front-end pattern. Who, who's heard of that? Quite a few folks. Great, so the big premise of this is that you have a client and you have a service that fronts that, that serves that client, and these are very tightly coupled. And if you imagine the Netflix app or the experience, your iOS app looks very different than what you see on your TV, or it looks very different than what you see on your browser, right? And so. You want these things to be tightly coupled together so that when client engineers are pushing code to the, to the devices, they're also pushing their services in lockstep. And using, using the Netflix API, we can, we, can, we can also abstract away kind of the rest of the Netflix API. Um, and so you can make individual changes to your client and your service without having to affect the rest of the Netflix stack and move at a higher velocity. And these, like I, like I said before, these BFFs are maintained by UI teams since it's tightly coupled to their UI. And what this means is, you know, they don't, client engineers, they don't necessarily have the expertise to run services at scale. In fact, we hire them to not do that. We hire them to write responsive user interfaces. You know, and it's really hard to, to maintain and write services at scale generally, even if you're a back-end engineer. And so I want to talk a little bit about the API requirements and how that fits in with function as a service in JavaScript, right? Um, so we want really high velocity for these BFFs, since we're making you know, two, three changes a week to each and every single client. They need to be really reliable. Um, if one of these things is down, then the entire client is unavailable, and that's, that's not good for our customers. It needs to be really easy to use. And we want to abstract away the operations, because again, the target audience is for like, client engineers who have no experience writing services. Um, and so I think this is kind of where function as a service JavaScript and Node really come in handy, and we'll talk today about how we're building a function as a service platform on Netflix, and how we use that to unlock the ability for client engineers to be able to run their own services um, that's highly available, um, low latency, and super performant. 
And so before we can talk about function as a service, I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of function as a service and kind of cloud computing in general in the industry. So in the very beginning, you had everyone who owned their own data centers, right? Before the cloud, before EC2, you, you own like the literal data center itself and the walls and the machines. You also own the services platform, you own the application, and you also own the business logic. Somewhere, somewhere you know, in the, in the 2000s, AWS came along, and now they were able to abstract away using infrastructure as a service, the data center itself. <clears throat> and so now in, in, instead of having to build your own data center and get your own um, get your inf infrastructure, you could just provision that using EC2. But you were still responsible for the services platform, the application, as well as your business logic. Uh, then when the industry moved to platform as a service, so now we abstracted away the services platform as well. But again, you still own the application and, and the infrastructure, um, sorry, the application and your business logic, and you still have to own the, the, um, the operations of it. And then finally today, I think this new paradigm is emerging with function as a service where you know, we abstract away everything, right? Everything's managed for you except for the business logic that you want to write. And I think this is helpful to think about because for our client engineers, this is really important too because they don't really care about any of the infrastructure or the operations or the platform, they just care about the business logic that's specific to their app. And I think this probably finds um, a lot of common ground with some of you here as well who do that kind of stuff. Um, and so when we're thinking about building or buy, uh, versus buying our own function as a service platform, um, this was a few years ago, a lot of questions came to mind because one of the biggest questions is, you know, how come you guys aren't using, insert some third party serverless function as a service solution? At the time, there wasn't really anything in the market that could support our scale or integrate with our ecosystem, or um, that was built for request response and services. Uh, most of the offerings out there were really for event-driven um, uh, workloads, and so we decided to build our own. Um, and so we'll cover kind of the platform today in three steps, uh, three sections, the runtime platform architecture, the developer experience, as well as management and operations um, of the function platform. So let's talk about the runtime platform architecture. And before we can talk about the function as a service platform, I want to go back to this diagram because I think we need to talk about how we're building infrastructure and platform in general in Netflix. So if we talk about infrastructure as a service, uh, most of you probably know we're completely hosted on the cloud using AWS. And kind of EC2 is that common base level of infrastructure that we use to run every single service that, we, that exists, right? Um, however, as we were building the function as a service platform, we decided that actually, instead of just using VMs, we decided to use containers um, as a foundation. And the reason that we decided to do that was that it gave us a bunch of these advantages, which made, made, made sure that our platform was, our, was ergonomic, it was efficient, and, it was, and we had a really great development velocity. So as some examples, containers start up much, much, much more quickly than your classic VM would, so we can get deployments and startup times on the, on the order of seconds instead of minutes. <clears throat> They're really portable across multiple environments, so you can take a Docker image, and run that locally, or you can take your image and run it remotely, or in a cloud, or, or vice versa. And that's really helpful for debugging, um, as an example. <clears throat> and for our cloud infrastructure costs, uh, we were able to more efficiently bin pack using containers, um, because we were able to do the scheduling ourselves on top of the uh, EC2 instances that we already owned. And so as a result of our decision to, to, to use containers, we built a technology called Titus, which is our own container management platform. Um, it's this really high scale op open source platform that allows us to schedule and launch millions of containers per day. Um, I encourage you guys to check it out. It's, a, it's really its own talk, so we're not gonna get into the details of this here, but it is like the substrate that allows us to run containers at scale on Netflix. And so let's talk about the platform, right? And what does it take to actually run an application at Netflix? Um, so we've created our own reliable and open source services platform. Some of you probably have already seen it or heard of it, but it's, again, it's all open source online. But it provides us with this really, uh, the set of components that you need to be able to run a reliable service. Things like service discovery or RPC or configuration metrics, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's built in, um, really too many to list, all of them are open source, and you can check them out. And so Sometimes I get asked the question, why are you guys building function as a service if you already have this really robust platform? Right? Can't teams just assemble all this stuff on, on, on their own and just use it? Well, it's kind of like going to Ikea and you want to buy a chair, right? Um, you see the chair at the, um, at the store, you're like, this is a great chair, I'm going to take it home. And it comes home in this pallet of parts. And you have to go assemble these parts yourself. It's kind of like that with services, right? We have this great store of 
really robust platform pieces, but you have to assemble them as a team yourself. And so often, you do it wrong, right? <laughs> and this is kind of what we're trying to avoid, you know, and then we have two or 300 engineers who are gonna be building these services. We wanna avoid them to have to experience that pain, right? Like, so some of the disadvantages, right, you have to keep, always keep the components updated um, to the latest versions yourself. And so we know, as, for example, that up, anytime you update your application, change one of the modules or the dependencies, um, one, it's painful, and two, it's not something that you really want to be doing, and three, it could, you know, there's always the likelihood that you could introduce bugs. You have, also have to ensure that the metrics and dashboards are created for your service, and none of these things are automatically generated. So again, getting visibility. Um, and ultimately, because you own the infrastructure and the platform still, you're on the hook for managing and operating the infrastructure. So none of these things are ideal for that use case we're looking for, which is we have client engineers, they need services, they don't want to have to operate them, right? <clears throat> and so you shouldn't have to set everything up from scratch every time when literally all you want to change is the business logic. And so let's look at the function as a service platform, right? And the, the, one, the thing that we've built. And here are some of these requirements that we have. There's no assembly that should be required. All the parts automatically update themselves reliably. You get observable metrics um, and visibility into the, into the service. And um, the operations are managed for you. And so ultimately, um, the overview of the platform is that it's a services container that we've pre-assembled with all of those components that we just talked about that's ready for production service. We start with a Docker container, and inside of which we drop a whole bunch of daemons that we need to be able to run a service reliably. So things like discovery and metrics and log rotation. We also bring a node um, because the, the function as a service platform runs JavaScript. Um, and inside of our node uh, process, we have a bunch of libraries that we load for you um, as, the, as the application developer. So everything that you need to, write, um, to, to run a service reliably. And then we have an HTTP server. And really, only inside of there, the things that are highlighted in red, which are your route handlers, those are the only things that you have to worry about and write. So this, everything else outside of those little red boxes <clears throat> is already pre-assembled for you. And this is, I think, a really powerful idea of function as a service and serverless in general, which is you're kind of abstracting away all of the common pieces, so that all that's left is just the differentiation part, which is just your business logic. We also package and version the platform as a single entity. So instead of you know, those 15 different components that you have to keep up to date yourselves, we do it for you and release those as a single version of our function as a service platform. And so what that means is we can update, upgrade the fleet uniformly, we can make sure that everything's well tested, that every time we do a platform upgrade, uh, that our customers aren't being affected. And because we control the runtime, right, um, we can make sure that the platform emits a consistent set of metrics for every function that's installed in the platform. So again, when you go and operate the system, um, all the functions, all the metrics and alerts are already set up for you. And so we did set, we, we set up a bit of a fast platform to try to solve these issues, and I think we did in terms of not having to assemble, um, pre-assemble anything, getting automatic updates, and having observable metrics. And we'll talk about the managed operations aspects of it in the third section where, where we talk about operations. So let's talk about <clears throat> the developer experience, right? Um, this is also really important. How do you actually develop on this platform in the new kind of serverless function as a service paradigm? Um, so we can talk a little bit about the, about the uh, development API. Um, functions are managed via our configuration API. So most of these fields are optional, but they give you a way to declaratively state and declare what your API looks like, right? So you have some things like the name of your service and the platform version. Um, and what's really important, I think, is the, the ability for you to declare your own functions. Um, so you can declare the verbs, uh, their HTTP verbs, as well as their sources. Um, we give you the ability to add additional source code that you might want to uh, bring in as part of those functions. And then there's stuff like configuration and lifecycle management, which are really important. Um, so that gives you a way to, one, configure your app, but also, um, introduce additional things into your functions at the beginning of, of process start, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, and then the business logic themselves, the functions, are literally just your connect cell middleware, um, which everyone here should be super familiar with, otherwise you're at the wrong conference. Um, but basically, you know, they're literally your, your standard, uh, you know, uh, express, restify, whatever, middleware that everyone's super familiar with, and you just have to export one of these out of your JavaScript files that we import. And so this is like a vanilla example of it, but you know, it can get pretty complicated if you want to add additional business logic. But one of the nice things about our platform is, you know, by default, 
all of the platform components, such as your metrics and uh, uh, agents and your loggers or your RPC clients, are all initialized and ready to go for you when your function is loaded, so you don't have to initialize those. And so by the time your function executes, everything is there and ready to go. And again, this is really important because you're no longer having to do the setup and back to the analogy of the chair, you could assemble it wrong. And here, everything's just set up for you, ready to go. And this also improves kind of the velocity, the developer velocity that we're looking for for, for our developers. And you know, here's another um, example where we, you may want to bring in additional components to your functions. Uh, and traditionally, you would do that um, in, in, a, in a regular app because you have access to like index.js or whatever your main function is, and you can start stuff. Because you can't, in this environment, we give you the ability to do that via startup and shutdown hooks where you get access to kind of the function environment. You can start any set of additional components that you want, and those are live for the rest of the lifetime of the process. So these are good ways for you to add additional things like database drivers or additional logging, loggers or whatever it is you need. Like, like Rick was saying, the hooks are initially before the platform starts, and they have access to all the platform components. And so it makes it really easy for you to integrate any additional libraries that you need. Um, additionally, any external dependencies can be imported from NPM, which is really nice, because we all, you know, as, as, a, as a developer, you're, you usually use a lot of other code. So all that stuff can be imported into your functions. And so our goal here was to cr also create a local function development experience that improves the software development lifecycle for developers as well. So we have this great runtime API for you to write code, but how do you actually develop on your, on your local desktop, right? And so what we've done is created a workflow toolkit called Newt, and this simplifies and facilitates like common developer tasks, right? Um, and like typically the example I would give is you start a new company, what's the first thing that you have to do before you start coding? You have to install all of the, your, your entire environment, all, all of the dependencies, right? So this tool has like a one-click setup and it gets your developer desktop to be consistent with everyone else's and installs all of the um, dependencies that you might need to, to start developing. And so we've also created a, a development function as a service platform for local development. And so now you can interactively test your functions in seconds, right? Reducing friction and increasing velocity. And the way that works is you have local functions that you, you've started developing and you, inside of a Git repo somewhere. And what we do with Docker is we, we drop a local container on your desktop um, with the entire fast platform that's loaded. Um, and instead of having to rebuild the Docker image every time, which takes forever, um, we actually do a live reload across your, your host and the guest um, Docker container. And that way, when you make changes to your code, that gets file synced into the re local container, that restarts, and then you have access, basically, to the service as it's running locally. And this is really nice because you can now look at logs, you can attach debuggers, you can hit the endpoints, everything's there locally, and you get this truly native experience. And so in addition to being able to um, work on stuff locally, you can also integrate um, your local container right, in, in, within the Netflix cloud because a lot of our devices, for example, they need, they need their SSL terminated or they need authentication or they need DRM decryption. And we have services in the cloud that does that. And so we can route device traffic into the cloud back out to your local container for you to do testing on. And that routes back into the rest of those backend services for you to integrate against. But sometimes you also want to be able to test functions in isolation without having to connect to or depend on upstream or downstream services, right? And so how do we enable that use case? Well, um, we let you test your isolated local functions um, by providing mocks and unit test APIs, right? And the hard thing about providing unit tests is that um, a lot of these components that you'll need generally require you to talk to a downstream service. And so we provide mocks for these services so that you can easily mock them out and then run these testing isolations. So here's an example where we've got a whole bunch of mocks coming in, and now you can test your functions in isolation without having to make network connections. And so this development platform can also be easily deployed to Jenkins, and this allows us to unlock like, the CI CD aspects of, of it of, for Teams so they can have nice um, CI pipeline set up to make sure that we're improving you know, quality and reducing bugs. And so lastly, we'll talk about the management operations aspects of the platform. Um, and this is kind of where we really want to make the, the platform truly serverless and uh, kind of abstract away the infrastructure from everyone, right? So generally speaking, getting your code to production involves these steps, right? You need to publish your code, deploy to production, and then operate on it. 
Um, and so the way that publishes work with the platform is you literally just publish your functions. And we create um, an image of your function, and we version that in a centralized uh, re re registry. So there's a, you know, there's, a, there's a command that lets you publish. And then that's, reg that's um, what, what's happening underneath the hood is that we combine the Docker image of our base platform with your functions and create a new Docker image. And then that's added to our centralized function registry for all the teams. So every team kind of has a bunch of apps, uh, fast apps, and each of them will have different versions. Every time you publish, these versions are unique and immediately um, saved to the registry. And now we can publish these functions um, to the cloud by our new, the new commands that we talked about earlier, but this is kind of our suite of developer tooling. And so here you can see you know, a one-liner which lets us deploy a set of functions to the cloud really quickly, right? In the span of a few minutes, we're now live. Um, and these functions are deployed using Titus, which is that function orchestration system I talked about earlier. Well, what happens is they, we take a function from the registry and then the Titus container scheduler then goes, goes ahead and schedules them into the cloud for us. We use things like canaries and, and canary deployments and analysis uh, as part of the deployment, which helps us minimize outages and increase availability. And these are all automatically added to your function deployment process. So whenever you deploy, you can choose to have canaries, and these are a good indicator for you to figure out if the new, new build is, um, is a good candidate or not. And we do an automated analysis where we look at specific metrics to make sure that, hey, you know, your new functions look just as good if, or if not better than the old ones. And then every single deploy function version can be managed via our control plane. So I blanked out kind of some of the RPS numbers, but here for a specific team, you can see the various versions of their functions that's running. Um, you can see how many instances of each one. You have timestamps. You have links back to the, the, Git reposit, uh, the Git shots to track them. And all the detailed historical information and deployment and management activity is available to aid debugging as well. So you know, next time something happens, you'll see like, oh, I did a deployment, and that's what's causing failures, for example. We also use auto-scaling to automatically scale um, the infrastructure for each function, um, and this saves costs and increases availability. And all you have to do is require an initial configuration for each function that you're deploying. And like I said earlier, metrics and dashboards are automatically generated for each function so that you, know, you have full visibility into, into your service. Um, alerts are generated and they're tied into to pager duty for each of the teams. So the goal here is really to automate and sort of provide a lot of value out, out of the box. Right? We have things like we're making real time and historical logs available for these services that you deploy. Um, profiling and postmortem tools, a lot of the work that we've been doing with kind of the uh, diagnostic working group, we make all of that available for these services as well. And so the, one th the other thing I would add is that the infrastructure and the operations of this platform and the application is actually handled by the centralized platform team. And so the UI teams are only responsible for managing their own individual functions, and they're only on call if there's problems with that business logic. But if there's problems with infrastructure or the platform itself, that's handled by a centralized team, and this kind of gives you that serverless operations environment. And so today we talked about our FAST platform. We talked about the runtime platform architecture. Um, and how we use Node, um, Docker, and the Netflix platform to be able to enable people to write um, functions as a service. We talked about the developer experience, a way to give you native a native development experience locally um, and our, our, our development APS. And we talked about management and operations, right, and how we provide tools and a whole suite of tools and metrics for us to easily manage um, your functions. And so I want to take, um, kind of sort of leave you with, a, with, with a, some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, one of them is that you need really solid foundations. And so before we could build function as a service, uh, we needed a really robust infrastructure as a service and platform as a service platforms. And if we didn't have those, we wouldn't be able to build function as a service. So if you're thinking of going down this route, it's really important for you to first um, invest in your infrastructure and in your platform. Um, the developer tools are also really, really important. Um, in order for you to unlock the development velocity that you're looking for to get with FAST, you want to make sure that you invest in the development experience, right? So how do you make the development experience as native as possible? And then lastly, um, invest in the operations tooling. As you go up stack um, and abstract away a lot of the infrastructure and platform away from your developers, they now no longer get access to like the actual inst instances or they lose the ability to see some of the tooling. So how do you think about, how, how do we provide tooling up stack like the 
like the way that we can automate it and automatically generate flame graphs or give them access to metrics or logs via web UI to make it easier for them to operate their service. So I talked to you today about our fast platform. Um, I think the thing that I will leave you with is that you know, JavaScript and Node and function as a service I think is like this natural evolution of where the web is going. Um, it's really worked great for our developers. It's allowed us to get really great velocity and improve um, the operational and availability of our service. And I really do think that like, there's, there is something to be able to run JavaScript on the client, run JavaScript on the service, and really unlock the potential for your developers. And thank you very much.